Upstairs at Fralix, show 414, real one. Hi folks, this is Ross Lipnick from Lipnick's Used Cars, and I want to tell you about a steal of a deal we got going on down here. Starting December 6th, we've got great value on a 1994 used, fully loaded El Camino. It's ready to roll on out of here. Ah, no. Yeah, <clears throat> you went too far. You're supposed to stop right here, and I'm going to shake your hand, okay? Let's move on. We're going to do El Camino. Shit. We are late on this. Now I have to refresh my memory about fucking El Camino because we just watched, I think, two weeks ago. Oh, come on. This is this is going to be a walk in the park. I this need to see easy. this. Uh, there's this wonderful article in Den of Geek where they actually break down the timeline and chronology of all the Breaking Bad stuff. Let's see. And... There was a nice. Okay. Didn't think this one needed. <clears throat> didn't think this one needed that much freaking Well, there were some interesting points in here. Uh, here it is. Yeah. Uh, there were some interesting points. Mainly, the thing about El Camino is that it only takes place over the course of four days. Uh, it does, and it takes place right after, right after the events of the final episode of Breaking Bad, which means it is not the last in the chronology because the last in the chronology, as we know, are the final four episodes of is... Better Call Saul, right? Which Better is, I guess, I don't know what, you, I have to look that, I have to check that here, too. I believe 2010. Uh, uh, burr, burr, burr. Flash forwards, flash forwards. Yes, okay, so, El Camino takes place, according to, according to this article, Den of Geek. Uh, maybe I'll put it in the show notes, if I can, this, uh, this link for the article. Uh, September, se between September 7th and September 10th of 2010. And it is the four days, the last four days of Jesse Pinkman in Albuquerque, basically. Now, uh, the Better Call Saul stuff takes place uh, starting in sep from September of 2010 to December 10th. So basically, I guess he's only he's only working at the Cinnabon for like a handful of months, right? Well, you also again we also oh have yeah to that's right right I forgot you? Breaking Bad ends. He was yeah. Uh, it, he was gone for a year. So when does Breaking Bad end? What? When, wait, let me check. Break it, Breaking Bad. Breaking September Bad ends. Of 2010. Okay, September of 2010. But you also have to remember, Saul disappeared himself for a year. Say him and uh, what you call it? Jesse was already being cap held captive for a year. Walter was in exile for a year. Same right. with uh, same same with uh, Saul. Saul and Walter had disappeared right, themselves. Right. <clears throat> Saul was already balls deep in fucking Omaha, Nebraska, working at that Cinnabon while all that bullshit was going on in Albuquerque. Saul was right, out. Right, right, okay. Was gone. So Saul was gone for a year? Saul was already gone. He was already working at the Cinnabon for over a year. And that's when he even okay, said... Okay, so it's only what we to, see. Uh, to, Frances to Francesca, he said, hey, be at this payphone this day, this year, this time, right. I will call you. Uh, and also Ed... Had filled him in on who he was supposed to be when he, yeah, when Gene he disappears, Tackett, you know. And he actually says something. Didn't he actually say something about I'm going to get a job as a Cinnabon manager in Omaha, Nebraska? <laughs> yeah, he makes a joke. He made a joke about it. it's like, hey, if we're if we're careful this time next year, I could be operating a Cinnabon in Omaha. Yeah. So what we're seeing that black and white, those four episodes, those final four episodes, and also the beginnings of of the Better Call Saul episodes uh, seasons for the first five seasons. Uh, we see these little black and white bits where he is the mustache, and he still gets recognized. I don't understand that. <laughs> He's like, say it. Say it. Better call Saul. Better no, call no, Saul. Do the finger. Better call Saul. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we get that, and then we get the final four episodes, which start with Nippy and end with Saul gone. And uh, that is the final. that is the final bit of the Breaking Bad chronology. But before then... Everyone had wanted to know. And also, it was a, you know, Jesse Pinkman is a very popular character. He disappears, you know, for until the end of the fourth season of Better Call Saul. Then we get 2019 is devoted basically to El Camino. Vince Gilligan writes and directs this movie. And it is a movie. It does get an actual theatrical release, just, I guess, for some, like a handful of days. But mostly it plays, it's a Netflix movie. Yeah, unfortunately, it was not. I, it, I believe when it did go to theaters, it was not for an Oscar run. It or should have, though, because like it was just beautiful. They just, it was a beautiful film. Yeah. Well, they, yeah, they should have, but unfortunately, it was an Emmy film, not an Oscar film. And 
Fuck you, Netflix, for not releasing. It should have gotten that because I know that they do that with certain titles. Like uh, there was this. Uh, I forgot who. Well, Glass Onions. Glass Onion has got got a one week run, so it could qualify. There was another one too called Roma, and I forgot who made it. Alphonse Cuarón wasn't that? Yeah, Alphonse yeah, Cuarón made a uh, Roma, and that and got that a one week run. And that run. got. Uh, I got nominated for best picture. Well, actually. so did uh, Ir- Irishman. The Irishman got a run, also got a, yeah. like a two. They decided, two week I guess. Run. I don't know. Was it a was it a conscious choice? I was it a Gilligan saying basically maybe the the audience is television, not film, for this movie. I mean, but then again, Vill- Vince Gilligan knows best, and he probably was right. Maybe it was meant for television and not meant for theater. Yet, regardless, I considered it. It's a, a film. big. Okay, I it's considered a big it movie a film. widescreen. There, there are certain sound things going on. The sound mix is a theatrical sound mix because I noticed this. We were watching it because we watched it right after. I wanted to do everything in the order that it came out. So at the end of Better Call Saul Season 4, right, we pop in El Camino, watch it as our movie of the night, and there, the sound mix is a, it's a theatrical sound mix. And what's more, it's a lot of the photography okay. is very film. Even though I don't know if they shot it on film. They might have shot it on film because Breaking Bad was shot on film. And I don't know if Better Call Saul was shot on film either, but it might have been. Well, I'm going to have to give you the flashback to about two years ago. Remember when I said this was my, uh, I believe this was my number nine or number ten movie of the of the two. Yes, let's put that clip in right here. I was like, um, what? El Camino? I knew nothing of Breaking Bad at that point. <laughs> I was like, you're putting a TV movie in here? What the fuck is wrong with you, Freilich? Just like the, the fucking uh, Andrew Dice Clay movie. As the greatest comedy of all time. What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> but but then but then let's see let's see refresh my memory. What what exactly did you say to me after you saw El Camino? Oh, I said I was wrong. I mean, um, I really enjoyed it, but but the thing is, you have to you do have to. I the way the movie's made. Yes, it is possible to watch it without having watched Breaking Bad. I guess if you put it together. Because what are these movies? Like I've said, this is a tribute to kind of like filmmaking. And I was thinking about Better Call Saul, too. Better Call Saul is, uh, it's, it reminds me of French New Wave, right? And a little bit of El Camino kind of reminds me of French New Wave, too. So you don't necessarily have to know quite what happened before the events. All you have to know is Pinkman is in trouble and he needs to get the fuck out of there. That's your basic story of El Camino. He steals Todd's yes. car, which is the El Camino of the title. And that's all we get, really. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. He he gives it to Pete, and Pete's always like, "I've always wanted to own an El Camino." <laughs> Let me say now. Now I will I will say this much: there is a difference. Okay, you take a movie like The Many Saints in Newark. That's a Sopranos okay, film, right? And then you t- and the, oh, the there's Sopranos also uh, and then you let's take say a, uh, what's it? The Deadwood. There's also Deadwood, Deadwood, but there's also your your thing. Uh, that the movies that you like, what's it called? Uh, the Boondock Saints. They made a sequel after how many Saints. fucking years. I guess the point I'm trying to make is compare. You want to compare apples and oranges? It's like the Many Saints of Newark. You needed to see The Sopranos to enjoy that movie. You really, I needed. suppose. Yes, it's a, it's a prequel, because right? You, it's about a young Tony Soprano. It is a prequel, but but they tried to make the movie stand on its own in a way. And having just seen The Sopranos. And watching that movie, I will tell you right now, I would have probably not liked that movie if I had not standing seen on the Sopranos. Right. The di- between El Cam- now, when you watch El Camino, the comparison you were making is you can still like that movie as a standalone thing, and having not seen Breaking Bad, however, you will enjoy it a hell of a lot more. If you oh yeah, I mean Breaking like um, Pinkman is is Regan's favorite character. She loves Jesse. She absolutely loves him. She. Pinkman and Gus, for some reason, she loves Gus. She she loves Jesse. Oh, they and she liked Nacho too. That's why she was really disappointed at what happened. <laughs> Never, or weren't we all? But we we kind of knew. What I was just thought it was happen. fucked up. I was like, Nacho, just get your grab your dad and go see Ed the Disappearer. Do not go back to these people. Well, he he was already fucked when he was out. He was stuck in Mexico. He had to get his ass out of there. He he was. Nacho was fucked the second he agreed to go help assassinate fucking Lalo. Yeah. So that was it. There was no way out. I mean, that, only it was, he had to die anyway. I mean, like, because as we know, the whole thing about Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul is that bit of dialogue about Lalo and Nacho. Obviously, Jimmy had no idea what happened to either of them. I mean, okay, but we do admit this. We were hoping against hope that 
Nacho and his dad would, you know, escape to Canada and be hiding, you know, hiding out there away from the cartel. We, we were hoping that, but realistically, that's I just not hope what was going to happen. Okay. That's all I know. His dad's okay. We, we at least know I would know love to that think that Gus okay is a man of his word, but Mike, Mike was uh, adamant that nothing happened to his dad. He tried to save. He actually tried to save Nacho, but he did. Uh, like he said, he warned him. He warned him, you get in bed with the Salamancas. Yeah, so he, I even told you that when it came down to uh, when we were, I was listening to the our podcast last night. and uh, Same thing you said about Gail. You know, and it was the same thing I said. It's like, you're a nice guy, but you know what? You got in bed with something you shouldn't have gotten in bed with, and you got killed. That's it was the, your own that's fault. That's the tragedy you know? of it, because he was just Tuco's friend at the beginning. He was just a friend. He was there. To help him count the money, to help him enforce a little bit. He never wanted to make this a career, and every time he tried to get out, somebody new, some new fucking psycho Salamanca would come in. Yeah, exactly. Hector mainly. It's like you know, once once Tuco went to jail, then Nacho ended up taking over for Tuco, and then what happens after that? Not uh, what is it? Hector wants his father to become a fucking yeah, drug mule because yeah. he's fucking evil. You know, so. <laughs> Got in way too fucking. You got enough crazy good. ass people. Now, you got enough crazy ass people running around. And then you talk. And then you talk about the poor guy who got in too deep. That was uh, Mr. Jesse Pinkman right there, yeah, man. In this movie, at least he gets a happy ending. Yeah, yeah. Well, the happiest he goes, ending that he can he get. has to go through hell because he gets out of there and um, he just busts out of there. And Todd's El Camino hides the car at Skinny Pete and Brandon's, and that, it's weird. <laughs> Um, um, Brandon and um, and Skinny Pete have not aged a day <laughs> in the. Uh, I know they have not. What are we aged talking about? Here? 13, 20, 30, Six years. Six years. Uh, uh, Aaron Paul. Yeah. He he. His face looks a little chubbier. That's that's about as much as I can say for him. No. Speaking of chubby, who we'll yeah. get to in a bit. Uh, speaking of chubby. That's uh, uh, anyway. That's Todd. We're talking about Jesse Plemons there. Um, I'm. I was wondering if if it was. If you knew if he had grown his hair out uh, and and the beard and everything for the movie, or did they just slap something on him very quickly and have him shave it off? Or and and this is, I think Aaron probably grew it out just just yes. for this. I'm pretty sure he did. maybe okay. The beard I'll give it. The, you can grow a beard quick. Mm. Anybody can. Give give me, dude. I had a beard once. Give me four weeks. I can have a great big bushy beard, but. Uh, Hair wise, yeah, he probably was a hair piece. Right. Okay. Might have yeah, been. Because uh, it's figuring. I don't know how long it announced, but I do know that they take their damn time. Um, Gilligan and, and the whole staff of the shows, they would like wait a whole year before shooting other stuff. You know, remember? Just, well, yeah. just to make sure that yeah, things yeah. looked authentic. You know. Yeah, to keep things within continuity, I should say. But man, this this was one of those. I think, and I even told you this in my first my first thing. I was like. This was a movie that really did not need to be made. Like we didn't want it, we didn't ask for it. But we wouldn't have. Yeah, I'm we wouldn't have expected that, it. I'm glad that it was willed into. Existence I think it was a nice. It was a present. I think it was a nice present for for fans of the show, and fans of Pinkman. He's the one missing element, who um, you don't know. There's no closure on, so why not make this movie? And it's so, you know what I like? It's so simple. That's I think that's why you can watch this movie on its own. Because the story is very simple. All, all, all that happens is, basically, he breaks he breaks out of that place um, where, you know, Uncle Jack and, and Todd and everything killed Todd, as we know at the end of the final episode. Um, he gets the hell out of there. There's an explosion. He's, but he's screaming instead of laughing this time. It's weird because he was laughing at the end of, of the Breaking Bad finale, but he's screaming in this in this version. Well, because uh, yeah, that aside, laughing, screaming, it could be a mix of manic I think... depression. Because as soon as he gets to the house, like he, and as soon as he wakes up, he, he doesn't even. He's know scared where to death, he is. actually. You know, because they're talking about the big explosion. They're talking about the end of Walter White. Talking about the death of Lydia, basically. <laughs> You know, and that's how it, that's how we know Walter White is dead because this movie solidifies yeah, yeah. that he's dead. He he shacks up over there um, at Badger and Skinny Pete's house. He uh, sleeps for I don't know a day or so because he's exhausted. Showers, shaves, cuts everything off. They uh, they try to get that guy, the guy from uh, the um, the impound lot or whatever, 
Liam Pound like, Magnets, yeah, bitch. Yeah, Magnets, no. he even makes the reference. Magnets, bitch, hey. He, he was going to do this for free, but then he found out the play, the car was wired. It was already wired. Somebody turned on a transmitter. They're going to find the car. Yeah, it was lo- yeah, it was low jack. That's and weird. That was I mean, it's part. Todd's this, car. Right? This wouldn't even be this wouldn't even be a movie if not for that whole low jacking thing. That's what's funny about it. Well, it doesn't matter because he gives the car to Pete and Pete just hides it, you know. Right. And, well, and well, you know what they do because then you find out in uh, this is what you find out in Better Call Saul. Uh, Skinny Pete drives it down to the border. Oh, okay. I didn't. No, I didn't. You don't. I didn't don't pick up on that. Okay, there, you don't remember that scene, um, because. When uh, Saul calls, uh, what's her face? You know, his secretary. Oh, Francesca. What's her name? Francesca. Thank you. When Saul makes the phone call to Francesca, Francesca tells him, "Oh yeah, Jesse's uh, hightailed it out to Mexico. They found, they found uh, his car down near the Mexico border." Oh, okay. Wait, what yeah, season was, was that? Uh, was that like early on? This was no. This was at the tail end oh, of the better call Saul. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, well, this is in the black and white scenes when Saul oh, makes okay. the phone call to right, Francesca. Right, right. Yeah. He tell you know, she gives him all the information and she lets him know that Jesse hightailed it down to Mexico and that's where freaking uh Skinny Pete ended up driving freaking the, the car. car down there. And then uh what is it? Jesse got the Fiero. Okay, you know what that means. Oh, I love though. That car. Well now we have to do a movie about Skinny What's Pete it? in Mexico. Mm. I would love to see that. Well, I think no, they, uh, what is it? Badger told him to hitch back. That's what he said. He said drive the car down to Mexico and then So hitch maybe he gets into some wacky adventures. Border, I can see it happening. Back. Let's do it. Let's call it Skinny Pete, a Breaking Bad movie. You know? <laughs> I just love that. He gives him the car. He goes, why are you helping me? Because you're my hero, yo. <laughs> That's, uh, I, I, I like love that. You know, you're my yeah. hero, yo. I like You know, I like those guys. I really do. They should. You know, that should be the next spinoff. Hey, Vince. Hey, Peter, if you're listening, do a, do a spinoff with fucking Badger and Skinny Pete. They don't Oh, I had a total great. idea. I had, a, I, had a, I had an idea. I had an idea. I wanted to do... I thought... They should do a show about Ed the Disappearer because a Disappearer, that would be episodic. You could actually do that. Unfortunately, Robert Forster is no longer with us. But what if you did something about Ed Galbraith being a Disappearer? He's a vacuum cleaner repairman, but he's also a Disappearer. You give him your identity. You say, I need a new identity. And he and he, he puts it all together because he's like a genius at this or something. That is a show right there. You should do that. I would do that in a second. It could be anybody. We could do we could do a prequel and see how we got into it and all that. Yeah, stuff. It's, it would it's be like, nice. You could to- oh, that would be awesome. But you, know. you see, that's why that's this is why we love Vince Gilligan because even secondary characters deserve yeah, their own yeah. show. You could do a char- you could do a there fucking so show about Francesca, could- but on Lifetime. <laughs> do we could do a show about Howard? <laughs> Howard, oh geez, Howard. We could do a show I don't want to say anything okay, because people I, I, are. I don't want to say anything know, about Howard because people are in the room. They don't know yet. <laughs> so, but, okay, they don't. Um, know. <laughs> but uh, okay, so he he ditches he he ditches the El Camino. He gets he gets the other car, and then he goes because we start layering in flashbacks. We start layering in flashbacks to the time when Jesse was being imprisoned by Todd and Uncle Jack in that little torture dungeon and making meth. Uh, he takes him, uh, Todd takes him out for a field trip uh, to his apartment to help him dispose of a body, his fucking housekeeper that he killed. <laughs> because she found his stash that's a great. Money. That's a great reveal, too, by the way. Because uh, Jesse comes in, he goes, oh my god! And there's a dead woman on the floor. He's like, oh yeah, that, yeah. I had to kill her. Uh, he's like, why? I had why? to kill her. She They're eating a soup. Uncle Jack always says, don't put the money in the bank. Hide it someplace safe yeah. where no one will find it. He makes uh, some soup for him and Jesse, and he tells the story. Yeah, some bean with bean with bacon. <laughs> and Jesse doesn't have an appetite, of course. He uh, he says she found my money. Uh, going, it's all in, in all my encyclopedias. I guess I now have to move it. He, you know, which is something Jesse should have known. He opened up all the um, encyclopedias. There was no money in there. He tears his apartment to shreds looking for this money. But before we do that, we have a flashback where he takes, he rolls up the housekeeper in the carpet, and they take it out to the desert to a nice location because he wanted to bury her in a very nice location, right? And he and he says a few words. He says she was a good housekeeper, <laughs> you know. Oh, and uh, we got to take the belt off around her neck, and and he puts the belt back on his jeans, and I'm just like Todd, there is something seriously wrong with this with Todd. <laughs> and the, and you know, and you see when you watch this. And then you think about Breaking Bad, you're just like, man, I keep thinking about that moment where Jesse choked the fucking life out of you, 
and you yeah. deserved it. Yeah. It's like you deserved the brutal, violent death that you got. Todd is another, because that, is another oh. character that also deserves some kind of a show. <laughs> Unfortunately, Jesse Plemons got too popular in life. That ain't going to He also got happen. too big. <laughs> Yeah, he, now got, there, he got to he got liter, literally and figuratively. Now there got are some. Too big. There's yeah. Go ahead, he, go ahead. Literally and figuratively got too big. He he ain't gonna. But man, I love him as Todd. Like, He's wonderful. You can't replace Meth that Damon. guy. You know, I I would love a movie. <laughs> Meth Damon. Meth Damon. Um, I want to point out there are a couple of little things here that I caught on the second viewing that I didn't catch on the first. Just as with Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, there are certain things you pick up on. In the second viewing, there's a okay. lot. There's a lot of world building going on, but Mason, mainly the thing about Todd is, he has a little crush on Lydia, and he he also oh, enjoys duh. making snow snow globes, and he made a snow globe of him and Lydia. Yeah. And there is a okay. When Breaking that. Bad did these mini mini episodes online, basically webisodes they called them, and there was a webisode yeah. about him trying to ask Lydia out on a date, and also a little bit about his snow globe fa fascination. I did not know this. And, and, and then I knew it at, when I saw the movie on the second viewing. I knew he had the little thing for Lydia because he has like this little ringtone. Lydia, Lydia, have you met Lydia? Lydia, the tattooed lady. It's like the last thing ever that Walter says to anybody is when he's talking to Lydia right before he dies. And it was Lydia calling Todd, asking, did you kill him? And that is like the little detail about Todd. And it's so weird because these two guys show up. They call themselves um, cops or DEA or whatever or FBI. I'm not sure. They're wearing stupid jackets. They're, that's all. And Jesse thinks that they are cops for a little while. And then he realizes, wait a minute, I recognize you. And it turns out to be the guys who welded this this horrible thing that he was tethered to while he was making the meth. Yeah, I remember that. And then you find, and then yeah, that's when he has that little flashback. It's like, cause, yeah, there you talking about the people that, I'm sorry, I, I kind of zoned out. I had a little phone that's call right. there for a second I had to ignore. Um, you're talking about when he finds the money finally, in the fridge. In the fridge. And then, and then right when he finds it, those two guys dress up as cops and come in there. Yeah, yeah, around that right. time. Because they knew that Todd was hiding money. And these people are money grubbing Yes, shits. they did. And then, you, and then you find out they were the ones who created uh, Jesse's It just tether. makes you wonder, where's the other $70 million? You know, all the shit that's in Walter White's barrels. Remember when he said... Well, oh, yeah, hold on. You don't remember that? The final line he uttered to Walter White before Walter shot him. It's like... Wait, I can tell you and where the boom. rest of the money is. Don't care. Bang. He doesn't yeah, don't care, care. But the thing Uncle is, Jack if they had only known where that money was, this little million dollars that's in the refrigerator would have not mattered as much, you know? But, you know, and then I like that, that whole part. You know, the one actor that no one talks about is that fucking apartment guy. The uh, the super, I think, the superintendent of the whole that's, apartment uh, complex. That's Marvin from D Die Hard 2. You exactly. got it. Just like Thank Iwo Jima. I remember that guy. Just like you would. How'd you like a new lining for that coat? <laughs> I remember that movie. Oh, yeah. He was one of the helpful guys, the guys who helped John McClane <laughs> instead of the assholes who didn't. <laughs> I'm actually glad, you, you, find brought, I'm glad you remember that was fucking Marvin, dude. That was awesome. It was good to but see yeah, him. It's, that uh, was, I love that he was scene. De I think he I was cast definitely because of Die Hard 2. <laughs> Because I think Vince Gilligan Definitely. and Peter Golden, all these guys, they're all movie people. I mean, they all have the same references. That's what I was saying. Kim and Saul would be, uh, Kim and Jimmy, rather, would be awesome friends because they share my taste in movies. They like uh, they like Martin Scorsese. <laughs> they like Shrimp Scampi, and they like The Thing. Yeah, they could be my friends. But that's it. I would not want to deal with them on any other level except maybe movie night. That's no. it. <laughs> I wouldn't want to hire them as lawyers. Definitely. Well, maybe Kim. Kim has a heart. She cares. Yeah. Kim's a great lawyer. Well, she's a good pro bono lawyer. So that's, I guess that's the kind yeah. of good pro bono lawyer you want to have. But after that, after that whole thing, that's when we find out Jesse gets all that money. And then he finally packs up and goes to see well, the disappear. He gets, he gets a third of the share at first, brings it to Ed. Ed's like, you're, you're, you're short because you should have paid me first for that last time that you yep. didn't get into the car. So I'm going to need $250,000, right? And he's like digging through it and he's short 1800 so he's like, and then there's a little bit of a standoff between them where he calls the cops. He's like, you didn't call the cops. He's like, you know, if you had called the cops, you wouldn't have hung up. They would have told you to stay on the line. And then the cops show up and he's like, oh, shit. And he gets the fuck out of there. Yeah, really quickly. So he I decides, fuck it. I'm going to take the rest of it from this from this Neil guy, Neil and Casey, the welders. And they have stripper, I guess, strippers or hookers. I'm not even sure. Seven hundred dollars an hour. They hire these women because they're fucking stupid. Because well, that's what you do to... with money that you just found, right? Yep, that's what you do with found money. Is you you get hookers and blow snorting coke, and 
Yeah. And he comes... <laughs> But then we got to go to the part where he, he goes, goes to, to his, his parents', parents house, house and like, he grabs an old uh, World War II gun or something, right? Yeah, like he grabs a twenty two and then uh, that one gun that basically fires the equivalency of birdshot right. or something like that. And then I, I and then what is you think it's going to go one way, but where it goes is freaking he... incredible. Jesse, when Jesse goes to that compound. And then, oh, it's kind of a variation time. on what Love Walter it. did with the garage door opener. Nobody was expecting it. Nobody was expecting a machine gun attached to a garage door opener shooting through the trunk of a car into the into that office that kills everybody, you know, pretty much. And instead, he hides, he conceals the gun inside his jacket, fires it through the jacket, and all he does, exactly. he just kills Neil, That's... Neil and Casey. He doesn't. He lets the other guy go. Well, because they they were just there they were at there the party. The party. <laughs> they didn't have guns. And he's like, dude, you're on fire. And they had, and they had no idea about all the money that freaking what was it? It was like so two thirds of that was what almost. Well, what did Jesse? I think it was a million like? dollars in the fridge. Jesse got almost or seven hundred fifty like thousand dollars. He, he was he almost something he almost like had that. enough, but he took he took the rest. And then initially he wouldn't have even killed the guy. He just said, "Look, give me eighteen hundred dollars and I'll walk out of here. I need to all get I need out. is eighteen hundred dollars. Give me eighteen. All I need is eighteen hundred dollars." And then then the fucking cocky guy just says, "Okay, well you know what? Let's draw for it. You know, it's like okay." And there's your neo western. We talk about the neo western, <sighs> but I think the whole idea is you have a gun. You're out there. There, there's no law. There's no law and order. There's no cops. This is it's strange too because the show we we go through. We go through Breaking Bad, we go through Better Call Saul, and we go through this movie, and there's a very little of a police presence. You see them a little bit toward the end of Better Call Saul when he gets arrested. That's about it, right? That's about it. The rest is just thugs. It's just thug life, thug culture, the way it is. Well, but after that scene, we get then we get the one scene I think everyone wanted to watch the movie for. We get that one scene with Walter and Jesse after that big Yeah, hook. it's okay. This is how El Camino kind of parallels the finale of Better Call Saul because he goes back into his life into little moments. And this particular moment was after the four days that they spent in the desert, right? And they find mm -hmm. themselves a nice hotel and they go to a nice buffet and he's eating and um, Walter just doesn't have an appetite. And he tells him, he, oh, you know, this is, this is the thing that really gets to me is that, you know, even through all this, and I know this was supposed to be earlier in, in, in the whole thing, this, this flashback. He's telling him, you should go to school. You should go to college. You're bright. You can do the, you, you're very good with business. Maybe you consider going into business and get a business degree. And Jesse just doesn't see it because maybe, I don't know, maybe it took him a little bit of time to grow up. Maybe Jesse grew up after Jane died, you know. Maybe that's where his evolution Maybe. really happens. Walter sees him as a surrogate son and treats him that way. He does the tough love approach. He tries to encourage him. He was almost about to kill him, and then he winds up saving him at the end, you know? Mm -hmm. that, that, is the, that is the foundation of Breaking Bad, and probably everything else that happens after it is this odd couple pairing of, of Pinkman and, and, and Mr. White. Yeah, that's what it is, and as man. He's, he's thinking about that. We... He's being taken to Alaska because he had a conversation with Mike at the beginning. Oh, I forgot about that too. This is right before, right yeah, before Mike dies and everything. They're they're deciding to, you know what? Let's just get the fuck out of here. We're done. We've made our money. Let's skip. Let's split off from from Walter White. And he asked me, said, "What would you do? Where would you go?" And Mike says, "Alaska." He would go to Alaska. It's just like the end of Better Call Saul when. When Saul keeps asking all these different characters, what would you do if you had a time machine? What would you do if you could go back in yep. time? You know, instead of this is now the future, like, what would you do if you, you know, if you could get out? It's like, I'd go to Alaska. And that's exactly he where takes, he goes. He now, what he's going to do in Alaska, yeah. what he's, what he's going to do in Alaska, who the fuck knows? But you know what? He should be glad he had all that extra money because that extra money helps him buy a life and can get a job. He's probably going to work on, I guarantee you, I know what he's going to do. He's going to be up in Alaska. He's going to work on a fucking pipeline for the rest Maybe of the Maybe he'll work on a know? pipeline. He'll grow his beard out, you know. That, that great big bushy <laughs> beard. But, I mean, like you get something then, here for, that you don't really get in these, in, the, in these TV shows. You get a happy ending. And I think, I don't know, it places the show in a different context when you think about it. Because is it really, is this the story of Walter White or is this the story of Jesse Pinkman? I think Breaking Bad was the story of Walter White, but 
then Vince realized, you know what, this wasn't just about Walter White. This was about Jesse too, and Jesse needs, you know, closure. Because if you think about it, the three main characters on that show all got closure. You know, it was always about Saul, Jesse, and and Walter, and then Mike to another, and, and to another extent, the side characters, Mike and Gus. Every character got their closure that they needed. Except for Jesse, and that's why this movie existed was so Jesse. Because you gotta remember, Better Call Saul was already airing at the time this came out, yep. right? So we all knew Saul was eventually going. The whole reason the show existed was so Saul could get his closure. Was you're gonna find out what happened to him when it was all over? Jesse was supposed to be a footnote, but I'm glad we found out what happened to him. And I'm I'm glad that he was the one character that deserved a good ending. Yeah, you know what I mean. Nobody else deserved a happy ending. Jesse deserved a lot of, it because... Well, the, also, this is a... Like I said before, these shows, uh, even good people die. Good people get killed. Good people die. Um, innocent people die. You know? And just... And, and, and we'll, to we'll leave it out here for this yeah. much. None of... The three of these people were not innocents. None of them were. But Jesse was the lesser of the three evils... And the only person he ever actually killed was, you know, to save his own life, essentially. You know, it's like, it's literally the expression of it's either you or me. Sorry, you gotta go. Yep. And he just did what he had to do for money. So, I mean, again, I'm glad he got the ending he deserved. So, uh, final thoughts. I, uh, we are, uh, as I said, I'm on my second watch of Better Call Saul. And we're in the final season right now. And uh, it's interesting how all, all of this... You know everything that we see in this in this prequel of Better Call Saul. Uh, everything that is set up, uh, where you have these three different uh, drug lords all working for Don Eladio. You have Gus, you have Salamanca, and you have Bolsa, and the, each of them get their territory split up, and it becomes this system, and then it becomes this thing with meth, because of Breaking Bad. And you realize what Walter has done when he puts the bomb in Hector's wheelchair and how it all ends after that. You, you realize okay. what he has done. He has completely destroyed everything in his path. And he has created new enemies. And all of this, everything that you see directly connects to everything that happens to Jesse in El Camino. And then later on in the final season of... Better Call Saul, because they had a little bit of a break, I guess. Because They, they had a whole year mm. off, I guess, making the El Camino movie. Oh, yeah, of course. Vince is going to use the same crew. Things are a little bit different, though, in El Camino. Because it's a movie, like I said, this... And it's shot, and it's shot with a different It's shot lens, with a different... Course. It's even shot with a different eye, too. I mean, it's like there's there's a cinematic eye going on in this. Yeah, it, I mean, and it feels like a cinematic film. It does not feel like... a like a tv movie it does not feel like an episode of television it feels like it's an actual film. it should be it should have been i wish it had gotten some kind of a big theatrical release but i do you know what okay let's just say this is vince being smart look how popular this the up until breaking bad the sopranos was considered one of the best if not the best drama on television yeah. right and it, well, again i said and divisive ending aside, whatever, there are people out. The general consensus was that The Sopranos is one of the greatest dr TV dramas ever made. And what happened when they made a movie about it? The movie did not do all that well mm. in theaters. Okay. Vince Gilligan probably said the same thing and goes, you know what? Breaking Bad may be this popular television show, but I guarantee you if this movie goes out into theaters, it's not going to pull, you know, it's not going to do well. Well, I, yeah, I think it's probably because... I mean, look at, look at, dude, look at uh, Serenity. Okay, now, yeah. I love Serenity. And that movie went to theaters, and it was based off of a TV show that only lasted yeah, know, 12 episodes. I know, I know. That's so strange. Okay, now, how, how well did that movie do? It didn't do very Not well. Very. It just sort of got dumped because... But it was a great movie. I mean, don't get me wrong. It was a phenomenal It was okay. I didn't movie. like that, um, that they oh, killed Oh, whatever, man. Movie. Whatever. I, okay, I don't, okay, <laughs> whatever. All right, I love that fucking movie. Thank you very much. Uh, that being said, it was not successful. It did not make that kind of money. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I think it broke even. I think it. Well, actually, broke there's even. a really good video on YouTube, if I could just remember it, but it explains why it didn't do well, and it had to do with the marketing, with the Universal 
uh, Universal Pictures released that movie, and they marketed. They didn't really market the movie, you know. No, they didn't, and they they tried to distance it from Firefly. And then calling it that, Serenity that for crying out like... loud. I mean, t- they should have called well, it Firefly they, they the movie to, because fo- fo- they had to because Fox had the license to Firefly. And plus, they had to also, I mean, the show getting canceled. It never even got a shot. Fox didn't really, and they aired all the episodes out of order. I remember watching it in its run, and I was like, "What the fuck's going on here?" Because the, all the episodes were out of order. They didn't even show the pilot until like right until the yeah. end of the run. They did that with a bunch They did that They just completely shows, fucked it up. I don't understand why you throw all this money at this because it was a very expensive show. And then you fucking bury it. You put it on Friday, too. I don't know why you do that. I mean, I'm the only... I think the only really successful, you know, movie that... Well, X-Files. Okay. The X-Files. The, I, I, I get, thank you. That, I was going to get to that. There's a Vince Gilligan connection. It was like, Vince already knew that was like, okay... The reason the X Files movie was successful is because the X Files was still on fucking television. And it was at the height of its popularity. It was between the sixth exactly. and seventh, or fifth and sixth seasons. And then look at, and then of course, look what happened to the X Files. I want to believe it did. It tanked. did tank because it was like that movie. What was that tanked. 2012 when that movie came out? Oh, uh, earlier than that, like 20, 2008, 2009. X Files. That X Files movie tanked. So you know, Vince probably knew. That even though the movie probably could have done well in theaters, hey, you know what? I got a Netflix deal out of it. I get to make my movie, and I'm going to dump it on streaming. Fuck it. And on top of that, I guarantee you, you got to make the movie. And as we said, uh, I, I was I was trying to make this point a while back. And Sony put up the money for it. Sony put up the money for it, too. I mean, you got to remember, Sony had yeah. to put up the money. But I also Not, wanted to say that that um, that Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, these, were, these shows were, were – they were – what you call growers, not showers. They had to right. grow. They had to grow a base. And uh, they did, apparently. You know, I mean, it's like everybody was talking about it. Especially at the end of Better Call Saul this year, people were talking about it constantly. Yeah, finally got, you know, Better Call Saul finally got that recognition that at the very end because a lot... I still think a lot of people were tre- very trepidatious about Better Call Saul because it never got the ratings that Breaking Bad got. But now more people are going to discover Better Call Saul to figure, hey, this is actually a good yeah, show. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing. I mean, my, my wife uh, was really impressed by this. She said that she had not seen a television show like this in, in such a long time. And also, I mean, like just all the little bits. The, the, there's the great writing. Like I said, Breaking Bad is, is the writing and Be- Better Call Saul is filmmaking. I mean, it's like incredible mm-hmm. filmmaking. And I can see so many differences. That's why there's so many... Like, I watch these TV shows. You know what a typical television show is? It's The Blacklist. The Blacklist is 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 how you make TV shows. You do this... It's jarring with so much music and loud and, and sound effects and cutting and a hundred different shots. And just it's just like overstimulation. You can actually sit back and you can enjoy Better Call Saul and you can just watch the show. And it just unfolds, and it's like they, they don't insult the audience. They don't. Um, okay, I think it's... Ooh, I'm going to run out of battery if I don't stop now. So, All right, well, all right, let's thank wrap you it for up. listening, and we will be back at some point to talk about Ralph Macchio and William Zabka. Well, <laughs> at some yes, point. We and will. we'll also be talking AKA about Nightmare on Elm Pro- Street. Yeah, because you want to do that, and we're also going to talk about a few other things. Too. All right, so uh, uh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and thanks, John, for... for, for introducing these shows to me it was really wonderful nah, not a problem i'm i'm glad uh, i pleased to please aim, to aim. <laughs> i pleased you to are aim. really <laughs> sick all right he is sick and uh we'll give him a few months to recover so good night guys all right good night